Evening. Welcome. Hello, good evening. My name is Brian Hone, and I am the Curator of Education at MassArt Art Museum, or MAM as we like to call ourselves. MAM is Boston's only free museum of contemporary art. We are located on the campus of Massachusetts College of Art and Design and are the nation's first and only independent public college of art and design and the first to grant a degree. Thank you. Yes, woo, indeed. <laughs> it is an honor to welcome you tonight to this special event, whether you're joining us in person or virtually. We would like to begin by acknowledging and paying homage to those whose land we currently live, study, and work on. The campus of Massachusetts College of Art and Design is located on the lands of indigenous tribes such as the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts. We make this land acknowledgement to pay respect to these communities past, present, and future, and to recognize the painful history of erasure and ongoing violence towards indigenous people in North America and around the world. We acknowledge this part of our history to affirm our values to pursue a more just, compassionate, and equitable learning environment. This talk is offered in connection with MAM's current exhibition, May Stevens, My Mothers, which highlights the work of artist, activist, mass art alumna, and founding member of the Gorilla Girls, May Stevens. Tonight, I am very excited to welcome to mass art another founding member of the Gorilla Girls, Frida Kahlo who will share how these audacious, anonymous artist activists have been fighting for social justice in the art world for almost 40 years. The Gorilla Girls have used disruptive headlines, outrageous visuals, and striking statistics to expose gender and racial biases and corruption in art, film, politics, and pop culture. The Gorilla Girls have exhibited all over the world, staged, um, interventions, penned books, and realized countless projects exposing discrimination, biases, unfair practices, and the bad behavior of cultural institutions. As a note, this talk will contain coarse language, full frontal nudity, and the discussion of sexual abuse. Frida's talk will be followed by a short audience question and answer. While our virtual participants have submitted questions in advance, our in-person audience will be invited to ask questions from the microphone that will be just right over here in the aisle. And finally, after uh, tonight's talk, we invite all of you back to Mass Art Art Museum to check out Gorilla Girls reading materials and ephemera and to explore the exhibition, May Stevens, My Mothers. And now, please join me in welcoming Frida Kahlo. Banana, everyone. Bananas. Please. <laughs> And it's not easy to get down steps in a gorilla mask. This one is really special. But you are praying for it, I see. Uh oh, I love dogs. Did you like bananas? Two more bananas. Let's see. Should we make it a contest? The art world is such a contest, isn't it? There we go. You got it. One more. You had you had the nerve to come in the front row. Okay. It's great to see you all here on a spring day in Boston, where the when there are so many other wonderful things to do. So let's get right to the point. <clears throat> it's great to be back in Boston. And I'm really happy to be here to celebrate the life and the work of our dear late founding member, Mae Stevens. And it's particularly <clears throat> meaningful to be here at Mass Art, which is exactly the spot where Mae started her creative journey. I think that Mae would agree <clears throat> that it's a tough time all over the world right now. 
demagogues, fascists, white supremacists are all on the rise. And then there's the lingering pandemic, income inequality, extreme poverty, and cataclysmic climate change. Are you kind of stressed out like I am? Especially now looking forward to the 2024 elections? <clears throat> Maybe it would be a good idea to start out this beautiful spring evening with one big collective scream, okay? One, two, three. Let's make sure they hear it all the way over in Cambridge. Let's go. One, two, three. Didn't that feel good? <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm Frida Kahlo. I'm one of the founding members of the Gorilla Girls, and I've been involved with just about everything the Gorilla Girls have done from 1985 until today. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing this, I love doing this crazy transformative work about sexism, racism, and corruption. And over the years, I've learned with my collective members, we've developed a special way of making political art using the persuasive strategies of humor and messaging. We don't point to something and say it's bad. We try to figure out a way to get people to see something they didn't realize and perhaps they didn't agree with. And then we try to change their minds. Let me explain a little bit about what it's like to be a girl. Imagine <clears throat> it's 1984. You're a woman artist, and you start to notice that almost all the opportunities in the art world are going to guys, white guys. Imagine you go to a protest outside the Museum of Modern Art when it opens an exhibition it promoted as an international survey of painting and sculpture. And out of 169 artists, only 13 are women, and only eight are artists of color. How international is that? <clears throat> You're standing outside with the demonstrators, holding placards, joining chants, all the, the standard protest things. <clears throat> and you notice that no one going into the museum cares what you're saying. Imagine that this is your aha moment. You realize there has to be a better way, a better way <clears throat> of breaking through people's preconceived ideas that the art world is a meritocracy where museums, galleries, critics, curators, and collectors always know and choose what's best. So you call a meeting, <clears throat> you decide to be anonymous, you name yourselves Gorilla Girls, you dream up a new kind of street poster to wake people up to the pathetically low number of women and artists of color, chosen to exhibit in New York galleries and museums. You pass around a hat <clears throat> to pay for printing, and within weeks, you're out in the street sneaking, sneaking around with, in the middle of the night with buckets of glue and stacks of posters. The posters ignite a public argument about sexism and racism in the art world. What follows? Hundreds of works, exhibitions, performances, workshops, books, billboards, not just about the lack of um, gender and ethnic diversity in art, but also in film, politics, and pop culture, as, as was mentioned earlier. <clears throat> you get thousands upon thousands of messages from people all over the world, aged eight to 80, saying that your kind of crazy Activism has become a model for them. Over 60 individuals become members of the Gorilla Girls. Some stay for months, some for decades, some for life, like me, and a few just can't bear even a single meeting. Their cis, you know, collaboration is messy. Um, <clears throat> they're cis, lesbian, transgender, diverse in age, sexual orientation, economic class, and from many ethnic backgrounds, Asian, South Asian, 
African-American, Latinx, European, and so on. Each takes the name of a dead woman artist as a pseudonym. And from the, our beginnings until today, we have fought racism, sexism, museum corruption, income inequality, sexual harassment and assault, and any other injustice we see in the art world and around. But let's just start with our anti-racist work. This is one of our earliest posters. It's from 1986. Only four galleries in New York show black women artists. Only one shows more than one. Not only um, <clears throat> did our poster point out racial bias, but it also pointed out the problem of tokenism. The idea that if you show one person from a marginalized group, well, you solve the issue of bias entirely. And our feeling was, <clears throat> If you're not into showing the whole picture, you know, tokenism is part of the problem, not the solution. Racism and sexism, when racism and sexism are no longer fashionable, what will your art collection be worth? The art market won't bestow mega buck prices on the work of a few white males forever. For the $17.7 million you just spent on a single Jasper Johns painting, you could have bought at least one work of art by all these women and artists of color. This is a perfect example <clears throat> of how we learned to craft our work. We, it, we made up in a, a disruptive headlines, we had a straightforward design, and then we backed it up with killer statistics. This was in 1989. <clears throat> we twisted the issue around and presented it in a, in, a, in a way that people wouldn't have thought about it. And we made this one to remind art collectors that in 1989, putting so much money into a single Jasper Johns painting when you could have had an entire museum of work by women and artists of color was not very forward thinking. <clears throat> you know, today uh, things are a little bit better for women artists but the top auction price for an artwork by a living white woman artist is still less than 14% of the top price for a living white male artist. And when we look at the top prices paid for artworks by living black female artists, that percentage drops down to a pathetic 5%. It would not be tolerated in any other economy. In 2002, a bunch of women film directors <clears throat> in Hollywood asked us to do this billboard just a few blocks from where the Oscars were being presented that year. And this is what we came up with. The anatomically correct Oscar. He's white and male, just like everyone who wins. As usual, we had to back up that outrageous statement with head statistics. Best director had at that point never been awarded to a woman. Only 3% of the acting awards had been given to people of color, and 96% of the writing awards have gone to men. Now, um, in 2016, we were able to update the same billboard in Minneapolis, and that was during the hashtag Oscar So White protests, because things really hadn't gotten any better. And here it is. Only 6% of the acting awards and 5% of the writing and directing awards have gone to people of color in 86 years. Recently, we were working on a poster about how the US has all those commemorative months for marginalized groups that get forgotten the rest of the year. And we had a hard time, those graphic designers out there will understand, we had a hard time fitting the word discrimination into a single line until all of a sudden the light bulb went off. Discrimination contains the word nation. How perfect for what we were trying to say. And uh, this project actually became a, a video billboard right on um, the Hollywood, Hollywood strip in Los Angeles. Here's our latest 
anti-racism project. It was a billboard about prison injustice. It was sponsored by an organization called Art at a Time Like This. And it was on the streets of Miami, Florida as billboards in both English and Spanish all last summer. Why does the US have 5% of the world's population but 20% of its prisoners? One reason, black Americans get more prison time than white Americans for the same crimes. And then it became a traveling billboard on the back of a truck um, <laughs> during this year's Art, Art Basel Miami. So let's get on anti-sexism. <clears throat> you know, we first formed originally to do street coasters about the dire situation of women artists. And, and here are some of the first. We went after artists, museums, galleries, critics, <clears throat> and collectors who participated in a biased system. And it was fun to put these, these posters up at night and then go back the next day and hang out around them and hear what people would say. And it oftentimes gave us ideas about what to do next. And what we heard after our first posters went up, the word on the street was that the Gorilla Girls are just a bunch of whining complainers. They're so negative. So from that, we decided it was time to do a positive poster to make women artists feel better about their situation. And here it is. The advantages of being a woman artist. It was an overnight success. We're still getting letters from people all over the world in every kind of profession as kind of crazy as mortuary science telling us that this poster isn't just about art, it's about their lives too. And everyone has their favorite. I kind of like knowing your career might pick up after you're 80. <laughs> Being reassured that whatever kind of art you make, it will be labeled feminine. And of course, being included in revised versions of art history. So here, um, it has been translated into 20 different languages, the latest up on the right-hand corner, which is Malayalam, and that's a, uh, a language spoken in South India. Um, <clears throat> it appears that the advantages of being an artist, a woman artist, they're the same almost all over the world. In 1989, we went to the Met Museum to count naked females and, to compare, and, and women artists, and to compare that stat. We came up with this poster, which has actually become a footnote to art history. Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 4% of the artists in the modern art section are women, but 76% of the nudes are female. And the truth is, this was a month, we go back every few years to do the count. And this was last done in 2011. And there were um, slightly fewer women artists, but more naked males. So I guess progress comes in many different forms. And here it is all over the world. Here it is confounding Stephen Colbert when we were on the, the uh, Late Show. And here it is in Boston. <laughs> In 2012, students from Montserrat College of Art <clears throat> went to the museum with myself, and we did a similar count. Then they rented a billboard truck to drive all around the city with the results. And when it stopped in front of the MFA for this photo op, we got an instant email from the curator promising to do better. Now, since we can't be everywhere all the time, I think I'll leave it up to any of you in the audience who are into counting to let us know if they've kept their word. A deal? Okay, great. <laughs> now, um, we always try to find a new way to present an issue. And back in 1992, can you believe it was that long ago, we carried this poster to a pro-choice march in Washington, DC. And when other protesters saw it, they did a double take on the headline, which says, the Guerrilla Girls demand a return to traditional values on abortion. But 
when they read the fine print, they learned that early abortions were legal in the United States until the late 19th century. Even the Catholic Church did not forbid it. So our idea of traditional in that first headline was choice. And today, I'm sure I don't have to remind you, conservatives all over the US are trying to make their religious beliefs about reproduction the law for everyone else. And in the, in the process, they have denied a right once guaranteed under our constitution. In the process, these conservatives have created an oppressive and dangerous situation for girls and women, and also for the healthcare workers pledged to care for them. So we decided it was time to rename the Supreme Court. And when we took a closer look at the lives and habits and ideas of the justices behind the decision that reversed reproductive rights for women, here is what we found. Meet the creeps who have assaulted your reproductive rights. And let me read a few of my favorites. Samuel Alito claims that women's rights derive from the 13th century, a time when women were kept illiterate, burned at the stake when outspoken, could be legally beaten and raped by their husbands, and the world was flat. Clarence Thomas accused the Senate of trying to lynch him when he needed to cover up the sexual harassment of an employee and his obsession with pornography. He's married to a woman who supports the violent overthrow of the US government. And I'm really sorry we did this several months ago because in the last few weeks, there are a few more things that we could say about Clarence Thomas. And this is the kicker, Amy Coney, Coney Bryant, Barrett, sorry. Amy Coney Barrett has said that her law career will build, quote, the kingdom of God, unquote. Of course, that is a place where, for example, an 11-year-old child living in poverty, raped by her father, and enduring a high-risk pregnancy should be forced to endure the dangers of childbirth than the trauma of giving up a baby rather than have a safe legal abortion. Talk about making a bad situation worse. And then there's income inequality and corruption in, sorry, museum corruption and income inequality. You know, it's fun to do projects online and in museums, but we still love the street best. And this is a street campaign that we did in 2015 to celebrate our 30th anniversary about income inequality in the museum world. We wanted to compare the wealth of donors and the salaries of museum employee, sorry, museum directors to the employees. So we put up stickers like these all over New York City. And here's one, dear art museum, art is so expensive. So is constructing new buildings. We totally get why you can't pay all your employees a living wage. Now, um, these stickers appeared all over New York on street signs, lampposts, and it was really fun to put those stickers up right in front of the Metropolitan Museum and at MoMA during Yoko Ono's opening. You'd be surprised, you know, all the little ways you can subvert and get your message out. Um, We love art and artists. Don't get us wrong, we love museums. But let's face it, I don't have to tell you, the art world kind of sucks. Sure, there are collectors and curators and museums who advocate for a different art world and collect all kinds of work by diverse artists. But the big time, big money art world is also filled with poseurs, snobs, gamblers, tax dodgers, 
insider traders, and even a few criminals. In fact, the art market has been described as the fourth largest black market in the world. And that's after drugs, guns, and sex trafficking. So in 1990, we looked around and couldn't find any code of ethics for art museums that was easy to find. So we decided that museum, we would write one for them. And this is what we did. And we decided to use a biblical form to stress its importance. Every one of these instances actually happened to a, in a museum in the 1980s. For example, thou shalt not give more than three retrospectives to an artist whose dealer is the brother of the chief curator. This happened at MoMA. Thou shalt not permit corporations to launder their public images in museums until they cleaneth up their toxic waste dumps and oil slips. And we all know what a presence you know, um, Exxon had in funding the arts in those days. And, for example, thou shalt keep curatorial salaries so low that curators must be independently wealthy or engage in insider trading. Now, um, a few years ago, we looked back at this poster and we saw that many of the museum practices in 2015, 2016, were even, were even worse. They have not gotten better at all. No one listened to our code of ethics. So we decided it was time for a new one. It's a new, improved Gorilla Girls code of ethics for art museums. And this time we imagined it as a monument that we could drag around in front of every museum in New York, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, the Met. This is how we, we sort of imagined it would be. Well, guess what? Last September, we teamed up with the art director of Saturday Night Live, and we actually made the monument. Here it is. And we took it around to all those museums, and we were followed by a film crew making a short feature on us for, for PBS's Art 21. So look for it um, in the, the spring. I think it's coming out in June on your favorite public TV station. Um, just so you can see what some of the uh, new um, code of ethics are. Uh, and again, we wrote this in biblical language. If thou exhibiteth super expensive art, bought at super fancy galleries, and donated by super rich collectors for super big tax deductions, thou must declare thyself the museum of super rich people's art. Thou shalt honor thine employees, never undermine their efforts to unionize and pay them a living wage with benefits. Thou shalt cast out institutional racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and colonialism too. Thou shalt banish board members who, whose businesses make the world a worse place. Out with the money launderers, arms dealers, climate change deniers, insider traders, polluters, antiquity smuggler, smugglers, addictive drug manufacturers, student loan sharks, and associates of Jeffrey Epstein. Now, we didn't make any of those up. You can find them all on the museum boards of New York City Museums. And finally, if thou dost not show art and hire staff, as diverse as the communities thou claimest to represent, thou shalt admit that thou art not exhibiting the history of art. You're telling the story of wealth and power. We look at it this way. If the US, the richest country in the world, is stuck with a system where the only way to fund culture is through philanthropy from the super rich, then maybe museums should only accept money from rich people who make the world a better, not a worse place. So this wealth and uh, power statement has been shown all over the world. Most recently, here it is at the Museum of Art in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, directed by <clears throat> Adriano Pedroso, who is an example of someone working inside museums to make change and to help them evolve. 
And to be honest, there are lots of museum people like Adriana working uh, from the inside to turn that big boat around. It's not an easy job. Uh, for example, <clears throat> this past fall, uh, the new curator of graphic design and the new director of the Hamburg Museum of Art and Design discovered a very embarrassing fact about its art collection. And they asked us about how they could make it public. So this is what we did. It was a huge banner that was, it still is up on the side of the museum in Hamburg. And here is the translation, <clears throat> the English translation. If this Franz broken, it's a pastry associated with the city of Hamburg. Um, it's, it's to Hamburg what a bagel is to New York. If this Franz, Franz Brocken represents 400,000 artworks in the museum, this crumb represents the percentage of women, 1.5%. And that brings us to our latest body of work, art in the age of hashtag me, me too. During the pandemic, we were a little holed up like everybody else. So we started looking again at those beautiful European artworks that everyone has to memorize in art street class. But we wanted to do it through the eyes of hashtag me too. Art historians call it the male gaze. Gorilla girls call it the male gaze. We started to read more about the lives of male artists who made those masterpieces. And we took what we found and made a website for Art Night, which is an art festival in the UK that went remote in 2021. And you can still visit the, uh, the website. It has a lot of information. It's themalegraze.com. And here's a little trailer that we did for it. And this is actually where the rough language and the talk of you know, all the, the trigger stuff happens. So I just wanted you to know that. Here it is. What do art historians call the macho, hetero, predominantly white male perspective in European and American art that depicts women as sexual objects for the pleasure of male viewers? The male gaze. But the gorilla girls call it the male grays. There are lots of naked women in post-colonial Western art. Sleeping in the backyard. Splayed out on beds lounging around with their friends, bathing, dancing, hooking up, being harassed, abducted, bound, raped, and murdered. When we looked into how some revered male artists used and abused women in their real lives, we saw more than gazing, we saw grazing. So the question we wanna ask is, does life imitate art or art imitate life? Gauguin abandoned his wife and five children to become primitive in the Caribbean and South Pacific. He married a succession of teenage girls as young as 13. He died of syphilis at 55 and probably gave it to many of them. European colonialism at its finest. Of the women who had long-term relationships with Picasso, two died by suicide, two had nervous breakdowns, and one escaped and wrote about it. In 1950, sculptor Dorothy Daner decided her husband, sculptor David Smith, had hit her once too often. She loaded her pickup truck and took off for New York to start a career of her own. Smith turned around and married one of his young students. According to the book Ninth Street Women, Hans Hoffman's summer school in Provincetown was a harem. And Hoffman, the bull elephant who patted his female students on the ass and fucked everything that moved. Lucien Freud admitted to having 14 children by six different women. He may have fathered twice as many. He said women go downhill at the age of 16. Sir Lawrence Gowing, principal of the slave school, pimped for Freud admitting young girls to the art school who had caught Freud's eye. Chuck Close invited his female students from Yale to his studio to sit for portraits. The ones who refused to undress were given $100 and told to leave. The ones who stayed endured crying questions about their sex lives while posing naked. Get ready for the male graze. 
the Gorilla Girls' take on our culture's enduring love affair with bad male behavior and art. Um, you know, sexual exploitation, domination, abuse, and voyeurism are everywhere in our culture. And our Male Grays project isn't about censoring artworks or condemning sexual content in art as immoral. It's about facing the fact that Western art is and has been obsessed with female bodies, sex, and violence for a long, long time. And any history of art without admitting that is incomplete and somewhat dishonest. After all of our complaining about the male grays, we realized that museums have been left with a really difficult task of how to explain the bad behavior of some of the artists that they exhibit. So we decided it was time to help them out. So to set the stage, here is the official portrait of President Bill Clinton hanging in the National Portrait Gallery in DC. It was painted by Chuck Close, an artist who like Clinton was accused of sexual abuse. What should the museum say about this? So we've got a couple ideas. Three ways to write a museum wall label when the artist is a sexual predator. Are museums afraid of alienating billionaire trustees and collectors who donated the artist's work? Not mention it at all. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Number two, for museums conflicted about disclosing an artist's abuse next to his art. Mention it just a little bit. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Like many artists, he has had a few disgruntled models and employers, employees. And number three, for museums who need really need and want help from the Gorilla Girls. Be straight up honest. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. He had a huge career with prices to match. He has been accused of sexually abusing models and students that he picks up at fancy art schools. How fitting and ironic that he painted the official portrait of Bill Clinton. The art world and the political world tolerate abuse because it believes art and politics are above it all and that rules don't belong to genius male artists and politicians. Wrong. <laughs> um, a number of years ago, we were invited to give the commencement address at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, and here we are uh, in front of thousands of cheering students in Millennium Park and quite a few very angry parents. Afterwards, we decided to turn our speech um, into a video rant. And it's kind of our manifesto for art and activism. So to sort of bring the evening towards an end and also on an upbeat call to arms, here it is. The Gorilla Girl's Guide to Behaving Badly, which you have to do most of the time in the world as we know it. Be a loser. The world of art doesn't have to be an Olympics where a few win and everyone else is forgotten. The art market and its hyper-competitive celebrity culture makes everyone but the stars feel like failures. But there's another world out there that's not about raging egos, a world of artistic cooperation and collaboration. That's the one we join and we invite you to join it too. Let's make trouble together. Be crazy. Political art or activism that points to something and says, this is bad. It's just preaching to the converted. Instead, try to change people's minds and do it in some unforgettable way. A trick we learn is humor it helps you fly under the radar. If you can get people who disagree with you to laugh at an issue, you have a hook right into their brain. Once there, you have a much better chance to convert them. 
be anonymous. Sometimes you got to speak out publicly, but sometimes it works even better to speak out anonymously. Now, this has its disadvantages, like working your whole life without getting any credit, but it has lots of advantages too. Our anonymity, for example, keeps the focus on the issues and away from our personalities. The mystery of who we might be draws lots of attention to the issues we promote. Plus, you won't believe what comes out of your mouth while wearing a gorilla mask. Be an outsider. Even if you're working inside the system, we say act like an outsider. Seek out the understory, the subtext, the overlooked, and the downright unfair. Then expose it. Jam your culture. Remake your institution. Just do one thing. If it works, do another. If it doesn't, do another anyway. Don't be paralyzed if you don't get it right every time. Just keep chipping away. We promise that bit by bit, your efforts will add up to something effective. Artists, don't make only expensive art that billionaire art collectors can afford. Curators, don't exhibit only the expensive art your trustees donate. Let's have more cheap art that everyone can own, like books, zines, music, and movies, like our posters. Show museums tough love. It's unethical that wealthy art collectors who invest lots of money in art can become museum trustees overseeing institutions that in turn validate their investments. It's a lousy way to write and preserve our history. Demand ethical standards inside museums. No more conflicts of interest or insider trading. No more cookie cutter collections of art that cost the most. Convince art collectors their collections are inferior with only work by white male artists. Don't let museums perpetuate this version of art and power with a few tokens thrown in. Make sure your favorite museum casts a wider net and collects the whole story of our culture. Whether you work in a museum or a classroom, don't teach an art history constructed by corrupt institutions. Do like we did. Write your own. Complain, complain, complain. Be a creative complainer. Be a professional complainer. Don't assume people know what's missing from museums. Remind them how many modern and contemporary art collections still contain less than 15% females and artists of color. Use the F word, feminism. We think it's crazy that so many people who believe in the tenets of feminism are still afraid to call themselves feminists. Feminism doesn't get the respect it deserves. Women's rights, civil rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, and Black Lives Matter are the great human rights movements of our times. Feminists like us who believe in intersectionality fight for all human rights. No one is free until everyone is free. Feminism is changing the world. It's revolutionizing human thought, given many people lives their great-grandparents could never have imagined. But there's still so much work to do. There are so many countries worldwide where LGBTQ people and women have little or no human rights. 90% of transgender employees have faced discrimination or harassment at work. In the U.S., no federal law protects them, even though nearly 80% of voters support such a law. Then there's rampant sexism in the tech industry, including the harassment of female gamers. And what about the gender earning gap that the U.S. Congress refuses to move against? Violence and abuse against women, gay, and transgender people is still a huge international problem. From gang rape in India to kidnappings in Nigeria to sexual slavery by ISIS to the negligible punishment given out for domestic violence in America. Trans women are assaulted and even murdered in the U.S. But despite all this bad news, feminist resistance movements are exploding all over the world. Let's make the F-word feminism the F-word for the future. Let's all join together with feminists on the right side of history. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to hear that at your graduation ceremony? <laughs> anyway, we're available. Um, as a grand finale, here is our very latest project. It's a billboard uh, that's up right now in Hobart, Tasmania. And it's about another global challenge, climate change denial. Despite the fact that 80% of Australians believe that climate change is real and happening around them, and a majority want to develop renewable energy sources. Between 2020 and 2021, the Australian government gave over $10 billion in one form or another to fossil fuel industries. We're really happy to say that it was announced last month that 200 nations have signed a legally binding agreement to protect marine life in international waters. Now, we would like to think 
that the collective actions of all the artists, activists who work on environmental issues, protesting against climate change denial and climate change were responsible in part, at least for this agreement happening. So we promise to keep making trouble in the art world and beyond, and we hope you will too, because we believe that creative complaining works. Thank you. Thank you. Now's the fun part of the program. It's your turn. You can rant, you can complain, you can criticize. Um, you've got the audience. So please, um, I think Aaron's going to tell you how this all works. And I'm going to sit down over there and have a little bit of water. Perfect. Thank you, Frida. Woo! Thank you. It's also not easy to sit down in a chair when you're wearing a gorilla mask. I'm always afraid the chair is not going to be where I think it is. <laughs> um, we'll now begin the audience question and answer portion of the evening. I'd like to highlight two of MassArt's guiding values before we begin. At MassArt, we pursue a just, compassionate, and equitable learning environment. And we honor courage, honesty, mutual respect, and self-expression. We ask that these values inform and guide our conversation this evening. If you would like to ask a question, please make your way to the microphone in the audience right here. If you're unable to access the microphone, simply raise your hand and I'll try to come to you. Um, we invite you to ask one question to ensure that as many people as possible can participate. And with that, I would love to begin our conversation and invite you all up here to ask. And if someone asks a question we've never been asked before, they get a banana. Yeah, it's a pretty lively room. Um, I'd just like to know, how does one become a gorilla girl? <sighs> Oh, we have been asked that question a lot. Do you want the bad news or the good news first? All, news. <laughs> All right. The bad news is it's just not possible. Um, if we were to interview everyone who wanted to work with us, all the wonderful people who want to work with us, we'd be an employment agency. Um, that's the bad news. Um, but the good news is you don't need to join us to do work like we do. Um, we suggest, I mean, the world needs more feminist masked Avengers than just the Gorilla Girls. Uh, find some friends, you know, identify something that pisses you off, and then together strategize and figure out a way of messaging it to the world. You don't need us to do this kind of work. We're just, you know, we're just hardworking girls who have become a certain kind of model. So anyway, good luck to you. And anyone who wants to meet her at the back, uh, we can form a collective tonight. Okay, this is asking you a question. Two things that I have done, and I want you to tell me if you think they are true or a made-up story. I went to a college in Western Massachusetts, and when I got back from studying abroad, I wanted to get a job at a very prestigious museum. So I applied and was told to my face, oh, no, no, we don't hire women as security guards at the Clark Art Institute in 1975. So I said, well, why wouldn't you hire me and proceeded to give all my qualifications? So that's one. The other one is- I think that's true. Thank Can I get you. this banana? Okay, maybe somebody else should take the, the question. No, no, no. The Next other point. one was when one posed without their clothes for a life drawing class 
And then later that led to the head of the studio art department asking this young person to literally take their clothes off and have him project slides onto her body. Would you have said yes to that? I think it, it it's quite a bit. Well, yes, but it's um, there have to be ground rules for that. And uh, I think it's just recently that there are ground rules for modeling. Um, you're not supposed to talk to the model. You don't engage with them. You give them privacy. You know, you don't interact with them in any way. It is a job. Um, I don't know what to say about that, but what, what do you think? Well, what was interesting is many, many decades later when I was on a tour and they were talking about this gentleman who headed the art department and how he coerced young student undergrads to do exactly what I was describing. I thought, ooh, ooh, I was one. Well, that's the Chuck Close School of, um, you know, nude modeling. Yeah. Well, luckily there are rules, but it doesn't keep all abuse from happening. Thank you for your story. Uh, hello, I, I just want to thank you first. Um, I'm currently a senior for the CD department here at MassArt Communication Design, which is just the graphic design program. Um, this was really inspiring work to see. Um, I kind of have like two-ish questions, but especially as like a recent grad, because I'm graduating soon, um, what is your advice to kind of uphold your morale and your values when you're going to a workplace, but when you're still kind of new and a lot of things are kind of out of your control, especially as a designer, you're kind of like a cog in the wheel, especially initially. So, you know, how, what would the advice be that you would give to like a new designer? And then as a follow-up in terms of mental health, how, I guess do you handle that <laughs> because I'm sure the humor helps, but I'm sure researching all this stuff can get really frustrating over time. Well, uh, for us, it's a little perverse because bad news is good news to us. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we really want the world to get better, but um, it, you know, it, it's it's when you discover something that's unjust and you can put your finger on it, and you can figure out a way to call it out. It's an incredibly empowerfully empowering. Um, revelation. And that, I mean, there's just nothing like that. And then when people respond to it, it's like, you know, you feel vindicated. It um, And it wasn't always like that when we first started out, you know, there was a lot of, you know, you know, vicious back, uh, you know, backbiting and people, you know, saying bad things, about disbelief. But um, we just kept our eyes on the prize. And I would say that working in, a, in the design world, it's a little bit different than working in the pure art world, you know, where, you know, your opinion is somehow what you're supposed to, you know, be um, focused on. But I think you need to speak, you, you need to acknowledge when you see something that's unfair. And then before you act, think carefully about how to strategize a reaction to it. Think about how you can change it rather than just to call it out. I'm, I don't have any more specific things than that, but good luck. Thank you. Good That's luck. awesome. <laughs> All right. And we have time for one more question tonight. Hi, thank you for your presentation. My question is, how do you handle your meetings? Do you do you meet once a month on Zoom or do you Just like 28 days? Yes. Every and are you disciplined? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then do you have ground rules that are very disciplined that the meeting can't go on longer than two hours or something? I'm just wondering how disciplined or how you go about your planning sessions. Uh, you know, I, I can't even generalize it because we did start out having group meetings and sometimes they would evolve into shouting matches and then other times they would they would erupt into just like total laughter um and every time is a little bit different and and every group of people there's a different chemistry um it's not easy to 
um, discover people he can really work with. I mean, there's some brilliant, talented people I couldn't work with because I'm kind of bossy. Um, so I, there, there are no general rules except that we respect each other's point of view. Uh, we let everybody talk. Um, we try to identify our skills and um, uh, admit them. Uh, not everyone likes to go out and speak like I'm speaking now. Not everyone likes to, you know, to do Photoshop for hours. Um, I particularly like doing research and I like writing copy. Um, and that's an important thing too, but it's just finding an organic, uh, you know, an organic flow to ideas and brainstorming. And it's really important not to talk over each other or interrupt. I'd say that that might be like the key rule. And um, if something doesn't work, um, try it again. And uh, just keep plugging away. You can't solve everything uh, all at once. And you can't collaborate with everybody. And you have to give up some of your art school individualism. You know, uh, students in, you know, in fine arts are oftentimes taught to be irascible individuals who will never compromise, you know, my way or the highway. That really is just another form of capitalism, guys. <laughs> Um, there are lots of cultures where art is not not competitive and individualistic like that, and I think it would help us all to look to those cultures and see how they produce, you know, visual culture to represent them. Sorry, that was long-winded. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frida, and thank you everyone for participating in tonight's conversation. At this time, we invite you back to Mass Art Art Museum, um, where Gorilla Girls merchandise is available for purchase through donation. You're also invited to view the exhibition, My Mother's May Stevens, as well as our current or other current exhibitions. The museum will be open until 8.30 p.m. tonight and we hope you will join us. Thank and if you, you, if you want, uh, after a little break, I'm going to wander over to the museum too. So, and I've got some bananas to give out. So who wants a banana? Thank you.